Hi, my name's Bob Grinier, and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. Okay, what you're looking at is uh, the title slide to this presentation, which is Exposure of 2% Thorium Doped Tungsten to Amasa Gas Part 2. There was some previous analysis shared uh, at the time of looking at the materials in the Magic Sound Lab in California. That's Alan Goldwater's lab there in California. And the subtitle here is Macro Exotic Vacuum Object Signatures Plus Elemental Changes. And so this was analysed in September last year, but it was earlier in that year that we went to Japan, Dr. Georgi Eagley and myself, to look at the work of uh, Roy Shinamaza here. And uh, this is the Amaza gas generator here. Uh, this is the operator and we had a tin can and uh, an x-ray down here. This is the head of a vacuum cleaner with a filter on the end, and we will have other presentations to look at the contents of the filter for the various samples. And here we have a uh, tungsten welding rod, and this is uh, recorded on a high-speed camera that's actually mounted to this tin. And this is the Marsa gas uh, jet nozzle, there's the, the gas coming out here and it's interacting with the tungsten here. So we have areas that are not affected over here by direct exposure and areas which are. And we are going to look at a, a set of features on this and the elemental compositions of the same. But before I go on to that, I want to kind of go backwards to go forwards. And in the previous presentation, I was looking at the work of Matt. Matsumoto, that's Takaaki Matsumoto of uh, Hokkaido University Nuclear Department and his presentation that he gave in 1995 where he spelled out that you get these tracks and these kind of tracks and these kind of tracks but also that you have these uh, toroidal things that hit your witness plate and over a period of days end up looking like a hexagon. Now, this isn't actually Takaaki Matsumoto's work. This is the work of uh, Leclerc, Mark Leclerc, uh, at Nanospire, and this is using cavitation. So it's kind of like I'm linking the two because the there is cavitation going on in the Amasa gas generator. And so here we go. We see this kind of hexagon with a spot in the middle, and these are the elements that were uh, produced in the Leclerc work. And I have a link to the presentation here. Um, but you can see that uh, uh, there's a hell of a lot of lead made here. And actually, he said that you must burn the carbon first. You must have less than 55% carbon before you start to get iron. But he's really only starting by cavitating uh, water uh, and then synthesizing all of these elements. And he also makes the note that there are alpha steps. So... You know, if you're questioning, can you go above alpha, i.e. like if you're fusing two deuterons to, to helium, well, it would appear with exotic vacuum objects, or as uh, Leclerc thought they were, these water crystals, you can actually progress in alpha steps. And these are effectively subcomponents of triple alpha, which is carbon. So, you know, carbon, oxygen, and so forth are made in stars. It's one of the main burn cycles of a star, supposedly. Um, but we see a high level of calcium here. Uh, we see a high level of lead. So uh, I am of the belief that so much material goes into this incredibly dense, uh, crushing torus uh, that uh, you rapidly, whatever goes in, ends up being, you know, lead or even higher. But then it, it kind of almost... Uh, uh, fissions back so that you then have a kind of balancing going on and it's just statistically going back to uh, the lighter elements and so there's uh, some fusion and fission going on in this process and we see this in many uh, experiments anyway uh, uh, he has some other slides in this presentation I've given the presentation link here and as always I will share this presentation that has all the links within it uh, in the description of the video um, but I've given it here, and uh, this is part of the presentation which you can download from the link. And you can see he's given a number of uh, examples here of faceted, what he calls cavitation reentrant jet impact pits. And so you've got your cavitation bubble here with your reentrant jet, and there is no doubt that this does do damage, and uh, we've seen uh, observations of something uh, like what could be achieved by a reentrant jet from a cavitation bubble on the Amasa plate. But here, these are on different materials. We've got a triangular one here, a sort of somewhere between a pen, pentagon and a hexagon here. Uh, we have a hexagon over here and another sort of septagon or hexagon here. And 
Um, my belief is that uh, Takaaki Matsumoto is right in saying that the ring around here would be predominantly carbon. I'm not even so sure this wouldn't be predominantly carbon here. This is a hole. This may or may not be a hole. I don't know. But the, the truth is that he thought it was a, um, a water crystal like this. Um, however, this doesn't explain the observations necessarily that we're seeing with uh, a Mars gas, but also with uh, other systems where the uh, active agent is somehow leaving the reactor, like in Shishkin's work or in Matsumoto's work, and traveling through the water, traveling through the glass, traveling through, in the case of Shishkin and other authors, the metal, and interacting with materials and producing the same kind of tracks and the same kind of uh, um, uh, sort of uh, geometrical forms. And so it's a, and and also not n leaving elements that uh, uh, it's carried with it, or that it's maybe synthesized on the route or on impact with the surface that it's colliding with. Anyway, so that is a little bit of context of another author that saw uh, geometric forms, uh, which is again uh, uh, talking about my last video, where I was saying if you actually care to look in Lena systems, you will see these strange radiation tracks and you will see these uh, geometric forms. And uh, Takaaki Matsumoto was really, really a pioneer in trying to get the community to look at these things um, and and uh, um, uh, talk about it. But sadly, that wasn't done, it would seem. So anyway, this is the raw um, tungsten that was used, and it is supposedly 2% thorium doped. And I've taken a couple of sections here, uh, and uh, I chose this because this might be a uh, lighter element, or it might just be a hole, so I selected that and just another area here. But again, I want to say a special thanks to Alan Goldwater, uh, his Magic Sound Lab, because he provided access uh, to me um, for doing these SEM and EDS analysis in California, and really um, everything that you're going to see uh, with with relation to the analysis of this and other materials um, couldn't have been done without uh, him taking the bull by the horns and investing a large amount of his own money uh, in getting that equipment. And so it's, it's just one of the ways that members of the project have sacrificed their own time and money to enable the project to do things it would never be able to do otherwise. So thank you to Alan Goldwater. Okay, so uh, here is some analysis of those two spots. And you see the energies of the characteristic X-rays over here. And in both cases, uh, you have carbon and oxygen and tungsten. And uh, in this spot, uh, we have some of the thorium coming in here. Now, um, it's only 0.6% here. The oxygen is 4.15 here, 4.34 with a 20% sort of kind of er error there. So they're basically the same. And you have a uh, uh, oxygen here of 14.07 and 13.99 with a 14.56 variation here. So basically the same. And again, uh, look at the mass normalization here on the tungsten. It's 80.6 here, 80.22. So it's really quite homogenous, but it does have these, I imagine, uh, manufacturing lines, which are predominantly uh, around the structure. So if you can imagine this was the tungsten rod, they're actually going around here. They're like annular rings going around the structure. And I guess maybe it's kind of cold formed and then sintered. I don't know. Um, someone might be able to find out how welding rods are produced from tungsten and thorium. But anyway, this is this is what we see. So uh, maybe the carbon is uh, some sort of deposit on the surface. I would imagine the oxygen is a deposit uh, in terms of its compound maybe with the, the tungsten. So anyway, that that is it and it's very, very consistent. Okay, so I want to show you the comparison at the same scale uh, using the same technique on the SEM, the same kind of contrast of the uh, feature in question in this video and the uh, uh, raw material. And what you can see, so again, uh, if we imagine this is our welding rod uh, and uh, it's lighter up here and darker down here, lighter up here, darker down here, lighter, lighter up here and darker down here because there is the curvature of the rod. And so... Um, that's that's what we are looking at here, and you can see actually these straight lines uh, that are the annular markings on the welding rod 
have kind of got some uh, damage in them. If you can imagine, they're almost something similar. And there are also occasionally these lines that run the length of the rod, and they could account for these lines. And it might be that the interaction between the gas and the tungsten is able to attack these uh, uh, sort of uh, focus points, these ridges and, and, and lines in the material. There is also these uh, faint, slightly darker areas, and uh, that may have been uh, maybe slightly more, uh, slight variation in, in, in um, composition, and that may be accounting for some of these lines here. But we're going to go uh, in another presentation and, and delve into what you're seeing in these cracks and crevices. However, obviously, the main feature here are these two structures here. And it's absolutely remarkable that uh, whilst the round area here all kind of has some kind of signatures that, that are kind of an like evolution of what you see on the untouched material, what you see over here on the, these two exposed areas is a completely different morphology. Uh, it doesn't have any of these kind of black cracks or whatever, despite the fact, presumably, it was exactly the same as uh, the unexposed uh, material. And it also has, the, it has these dimples. It just it generally looks very, very different. So something interesting has gone on here. And let's go and investigate that. So we'll look at this, and this is looking under a different way on the, under the SEM. Uh, and you may be able to see that uh, we've got a kind of hexagonal structure here and a pentagonal structure here. Um, and I highlight those by just uh, overlaying here. Now, they're not perfect because um, if you imagine if, if a structure came in at a, a slight angle, um, then it wouldn't necessarily create the perfect uh, um, uh, pentagon or hexagon. Uh, and uh, Matsumoto was saying that the the ring clusters get stuck on the metal and then over a period of days uh, they kind of fan out into, uh, in his case, he observed hexagons. But we have observed uh, a range of uh, structures, but principally pentagons and hexagons in various different uh, Lena systems. And uh, obviously, as I showed you here, uh, Leclerc observed other ones as well. So... That's the uh, overall structure, and then I want to delve into looking at it under different um, uh, ways of seeing it under the SEM. And you can see that it actually has quite a lot of relief. It's like uh, it's either raised or it's sunken. It generally gives the impression that it's sunken. So uh, whatever was going on in here was protecting the material or modifying it in a different way or coating it with something uh, such that it actually looks very markedly different. And in the next video, I think I take a zoom in onto this. And so we've got several layers uh, uh, of magnification that are switched between here. So the far field, closer, very close, and right close in. And then I'm ping-ponging in and out. And so what I'm focusing on is a feature here that's there, sort of near the one of the corners, actually halfway along a line. And so it's this feature, and I'm going to stop that. So here, it's this feature here. And so this area here is inside the hexagon. This is the kind of raised boundary layer, and then there's a feature out here that I'm interested in, mostly because I can see some uh, sort of semi-fused in uh, different things here. And this is purely fused in with this kind of wall around it. So I, I, I was interested to look at that because that's when you see interesting things in Lena where they have these kind of spheres in a kind of like ring and a spot type structure. Um, so I'll just play that, play that out so you can see it in context. So you can see here, this is very, very much more rough. It's like, it's like a a mountainous landscape compared to the plains over here. And when you actually look at this uh, SEM, when you look at the PDF, when you get it, um, this has a very much finer structure uh, generally. Um, let's play that out. Again, you can see this is the structure we're looking at down here in a minute. Here's our hexagon, slightly distorted, which is just like it is here, slightly distorted, slightly distorted, but uh, the triangle is always a good one. <laughs> but th these ones have got more free movement, uh, you know, freedom of movement. Uh, and so 
yeah, so you can see it down here, but this is very much smoother. There does appear to be something that kind of does ha and do an effort of getting through, but it is even smoothed out here uh, pretty much completely. And it's the same for the smaller structure as well. Anyway, moving on. So um, here is the, the, the close-up of the bit that is in question, and it's this bit over here that I'm most interested in. So... so uh, obviously a bunch of analysis was done and so on the area here uh, and uh, this is number 182, 183 um, you can see uh, 182 and 183 both have thorium in in fact there's one other with one eight, uh, with a bit of thorium in and that's uh, 18, uh, 1186 and that has a bit of thorium in which is this one that I'm talking about which is uh, the thing that's of interest to me. However, you'll notice that that one has very little tungsten in it, uh, comparatively. And we'll come to that in a little while. Um, the the other thing is that it has all of these other elements. So you've got uh, aluminium, silicon, potassium, calcium, titanium, and iron in there as well. Uh, and uh, so that's that's on the thorium However, you have these three, which all have uh, strontium in, okay, which is not in theory in the uh, material. Uh, however, um, you might think, well, strontium, could, could that have a, uh, a characteristic X-ray that is in the same um, sort of band? We'll have a look at that in a minute. But what are the ones that have got strontium? Well, it's this one, uh, 1182, this whole area here which is inside the feature. Then you've got this one, which is inside the feature. And then this one, which is basically on the boundary between the, the rocky area and being inside the feature. It's essentially inside the feature. So all of the ones inside the feature are presenting uh, with uh, thorium, uh, sorry, strontium. Uh, all of the ones outside have no strontium in them. So uh, that, for me, is potentially interesting. I don't know. We can consider that as we move forward. Um, but really, it is this particular feature that uh, is the most interesting. Now, the other one that comes in here, which you see a lot in Lena, is calcium. And so we've got some calcium on this uh, blob over here, calcium on 1185, which is this one blob here that's kind of fused in on the top there. Uh, you've got calcium in obviously this one and calcium in 1187 here, this little kind of blob over here. So um, it does appear uh, like there are some variations and potentially that some that are different from inside to outside. Now looking at the carbon, uh, the carbon here in terms of uh, atomic concentration here, 38, 45, 50... Uh, those ones kind of inside, um, then 48, 43, 47, 45, um, you know, no, nothing you can draw massive conclusions from there. However, I, I do want to refer to the fact that the starting material uh, basically had very little carbon whatsoever. So uh, it was by mass it was 4.42 uh, or atomic uh, percent it was 21.1 .1. and so we are looking here um uh at uh, atomic percent here it's, it's at least a, a doubling of the carbon and this is something that was found with uh, um uh, exotic vacuum objects in in the form of these ring clusters by Matsumoto okay so moving on here I am looking at uh, these three features which present with the strontium and um, uh, what's interesting about this uh, is in this data set it shows that the tungsten uh, is using the L series, uh, the, the thorium is using the M series and the, the strontium is using the L series. So l let's see if there are um, things that are close together on the strontium and the tungsten. And I have this Excel sheet here where, uh, and I did a, a Steemit blog some time ago where I um, introduced this sheet which allows you to look for 
overlapping characteristic x-ray so you put like strontium uh, tungsten and we'll put thorium in there as well um, and so what we can do now is we can go down and look for their characteristic x-rays to see if there are band overlaps okay so here we have the m for w uh, uh, for tungsten and what are we using we are using the l so that's not really a problem uh, M and M. So the ones that are close to the L on the strontium in this band uh, is uh, um, uh, using L, and we are using L on the strontium, but we're not using M. Uh, we're not using M on the tungsten. So there's no real problem to consider there. Thorium's out there on its own. Um, tungsten L there. Tungsten L there and there. Uh, and tungsten, 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 L's, uh, thorium here, LL, nothing, and then we got the strontium K. Okay, so there's the strontium K and the thorium L, which are a little bit close together. So uh, the st strontium K and the, the thorium L, um, so we have uh, the thorium's using the M series. So doesn't seem to be a problem there. Uh, anything else? Tungsten, tungsten, no, thorium K, no. Okay, so it looks like we really are seeing uh, strontium here. And if that's the case, um, we are, uh, it would appear, uh, going from high levels of, um, uh, what should we say? Um, if you go, go to the next slide, I think maybe, yeah. Um, We've, we've got, what is it? Uh, yeah, there does appear to be some sort of production of strontium there. I will look at uh, this particular one in, in, in uh, close up. And we can see here that um, this is the one where it has a, a broad spectrum of elements being synthesized at this uh, spot of interest. And uh, we can see that actually the tungsten here is 31% uh, uh, of the mass normalization. Now that's important because uh, the atoms are very large with tungsten. And if we look at the raw material, the tungsten is representing 80.6% of the mass in both, or 80.2, basically the same, but around 80% of the mass uh, for the tungsten in the raw material. But in this spot, uh, the tungsten has become just 31% of the mass. And you have a uh, large increase in uh, other elements, uh, particularly calcium here. So um, it, th there does seem to be a synthesis of elements. Uh, and are they in elements we would expect to be produced? Well, on this slide, I've used the Parkamov uh, calculator that I developed with Philip Power in New Zealand, and it's at nanosoft.co.nz. And uh, if you put in tungsten uh, uh, as a uh, product to fission, as a, as a uh, feedstock to fission, uh, you can see that the outputs are, you know, the first most likely output with the rare isotope of 180. Uh, it's only 0.14% in the crust of natural uh, tungsten. Uh, that goes to titanium-50. Well, we are seeing uh, titanium. It's not a lot, but we are seeing some titanium. Uh, moreover, uh, the 184-182 uh, uh, isotopes, 184 and 182 isotopes, account for 57% of all of tungsten. And this yields uh, isotopes of calcium. And what are we seeing a lot of? We are seeing a lot of calcium. But we are also seeing uh, the sister product of that being xenon. So xenon would move away. Now, it's interesting because it glows very brightly. And you're wondering whether uh, the tungsten's glowing very brightly, actually because uh, perhaps uh, there's some excitation because uh, there's a lot of high energy going on if this is actually occurring. And the xenon might be going, but it, the, the xenon would go away. Um, we also see the next one here with 180 is silicon, and then there's oxygen, and then the synthesis down here of carbon. And some of these sister products that are actually solids, 
uh, if they don't kind of uh, exceed their boiling point, they may go on to fission further. And I suspect that uh, the just like uh, these um, products here are have got alpha steps. I consider that y you will, if you're starting with thorium, which is all the way up here, uh, uh, or you're starting with the tungsten, which is here, I imagine that there will be some fissioning, uh, as I've just showed you, but there will also be some alpha cluster decays. And this is probably where the strontium is coming from. Uh, it's literally ripping you know, clusters off there. It could be even whole clusters of carbon, for instance. And so I think uh, it's relatively easy to explain these observations with what we know. Now, uh, I have here listed uh, the uh, video I did on the early 2000s. I think it was even in 2001 or 2002. It was an analysis of a, the gas produced by an early prototype of the Amasa gas generator. And when they analysed it, they found that it contained 0.28% of atomic hydrogen uh, in one of the samples. And so, you know, that is not a lot of atomic hydrogen. But if the atomic hydrogen is able to be captured into an exotic vacuum object relatively easily, and then the, uh, that makes a very uh, strong exotic vacuum object, that can go ahead and start uh, interacting with other uh, materials, in this case tungsten and thorium, and potentially doing the transmutation. As I've shown you already, you have uh, thorium, uh, sorry, tungsten being vaporized in the sapphire reactor, and you have uh, a fatter tungsten probe being uh, massively changed, and it would appear to the kind of similar elements you're observing here, just by the visual and the experience that I have. And also in the David Hudson, in the uh, disappearing tungsten video I did, he also had a thumb-sized tungsten electrode uh, disappear when it uh, did a, a high current low voltage momentary discharge into 35 milligrams of monoatomic gold. Now this is 0.3% at tops atomic hydrogen which has you know one or two nucleons in it. Um, what, what, what would happen if you had, uh, how strong would your Evo be if you had 100% with the, I mean, there's a hundred, what, 179 protons in gold? Like, there are a lot of nucleons uh, uh, in uh, gold. And so when it goes into that uh, black ring, that black donut, and the, the material gets crushed down to, uh, and I will talk about this in a future video, but essentially the density of a neutron star, um, you've got a lot of nucleons going in there very readily and the you don't really have to ionize this material. It's all already in a kind of superconducting plasma state. And so <clears throat> you can see what a very little atomic hydrogen does in a Mars gas. Uh, what would atomic gold do to the tungsten that David Hudson exposed uh, with an electric discharge? Could that explain what he observed in his labs? I'm going to talk about this um, more um, this week and next uh, with a view to looking at risks and with a view to looking at uh, uh, shielding from uh, strange radiation uh, and, and so forth. But what Roishan Amaza achieved is to create something that would appear to create exotic vacuum objects. I do not believe that they are water crystals um, in this uh, form uh, uh, because we've seen enough systems where the the activity, the thing that does the changing to the material occurs over a period of time. And this was defined by uh, Roishin Amaza, uh, sorry, by, by Takaaki Matsumoto in 1995. However, Hutchison samples where they were observed uh, in the 1980s and also with other uh, authors like Savatomova where they've done these transmutations and also the work in the early 2000s by, by Asfir Adamenko. The material continues to change and it's not like instantaneously changing with something flashing through it. No, it's slowly changing over time. And that kind of um, uh, speaks to this kind of uh, state of matter 
which uh, has been identified to last by Bogdanovich and by uh, Matsumoto to at last at least a number of days and to still seem to be dormant but be able to be made active by exposure to uh, sunlight and other light forms by Baranov uh, many, many months later and by um, heat by the lion author uh, many, many months later. And so... Um, th these things are um, active structures, active agents that can operate uh, over a long period of time. When I said in the previous presentation, it, it, it's almost, uh, you know, wherever you look, you see these uh, geometric forms. Here you have it in another um, uh, type of uh, Lena system. And, uh, you know, is it to do with atomic hydrogen? Um, uh, are we seeing massive synthesis of elements? I would like your opinion. Uh, I can definitely say that it does not look like this. That does not look like this. And the surrounding area does not look like the center of these structures. And so something very, very interesting has gone on. And it does speak to the kind of structures that, for instance, another cavitation system has observed in their experiments so thank you very much for your time and I will see you in the next video.